Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Helen Disler. And Hugo Disler. And we're from Farming Secrets. And we're very excited today to have B Winfield talking about her gorgeous, gorgeous little mixed farm, uh, which is a really wonderful success story, B. So off you go. Well, thanks, Helen. Uh, so I'll be rushing through uh, to get to the good bit. Mary B Organic Pharmacy in Mint in many ways like that biggest little farm movie if you ever saw that i'm excited to share what we've been doing for 40 years here how organic farming is fun and profitable when you team with microbes and here's where it doesn't want to go you know how it doesn't want to go sometimes ah there we go okay so i got obsessed with permaculture uh, bill mollison and david Hongren's Books were uh, arguably Australia's greatest export. Nature has the winning model, they said. It's smart to mimic nature. And this is my sister, Karen, and... Hold on, oh, Bea, Bea, I've lost your... Um, I've lost the main screen. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. Um, wonder what I'm doing wrong. No, no, so, I do, you, and I... Um, Lost you. So just wait. I actually can't see you either. No, I can see you and that's it. And um mm. well, you see, it wasn't letting me transfer, you know, change from one slide to the next. So I did something I made it able to work. Ah. What will we do? That's I'll have to escape and go to the Zoom. I'm here. I'm, I'm here still. Yeah. I will. Oh, dear. Don't you love technology? Don't you love technology? So good when it works. Um, apologies, everyone, as you know, I, I think I've had one clear run through doing this in the past, and I cannot get back to um, I go full screen. That doesn't work. Go speaker. That goes to you. And B, maybe you could talk to people while I'm muddling around here. And I'm sure, sure. Okay, so I'll pretty much just go through it from without you being seeing the pictures, which is a bit of a pity. Um, yeah, I. I did get obsessed with permaculture. We came here in, um, wow, it's not, right. Okay, bought the farm in 1984, 85, that's, I think that's uh, 38 years ago. It was overgrazed horse paddock. It was okay, bare. I'm just going to stop this and I'm going to start recording again. I cannot get through so if everyone yep. can unmute, you can talk to B while I'm messing around here. I'm really, really sorry. That's okay, Helen. We understand. So, hello, Jenna. We're having technical hitches. It's going to be So, okay. Helen, uh, welcome, okay. everyone. <laughs> Again. And welcome, B. We've had a little bit of trouble today, but we're absolutely delighted to have you here, B. And away with your story. Okay. So, infested with double Gs, which are prickly things. Horse paddock, um, 39 years ago. We think all the topsoil off the steep hills ended up in the acid bog swamp at the bottom soon after it was cleared, probably. Clearing would have taken place 150 years ago. So Nanup being a wet district with a 1,000 mils or a metre of rainfall every year from March to November, very hot, dry summers, we are a Mediterranean climate. Before long, we'd established 90 species of fruit and nut trees, we had great veggie gardens, kept pigs, chooks, ducks, and cows, 30 sheep. And little by little, we planted food forests. We used chicken tractors to grow vegetables. That could um, be a disaster some if they escaped, but mostly all was well and certainly the soil was being improved. We had a worm farm, we made compost, we milked a cow and we raised four healthy children and we 
it well. And uh, th those steep hills have become revegetated in food and fibre producing plants. It's hard to believe this was once 27 acres of double G's and kite, but my whole family helped with getting rid of the double G's. Brooks did weeding, pest control and fertilisation. Owls milk med fed one and all. We planted a quarter of an acre of asparagus and sheep grazed the patch in winter. Uh, ducks loved snail detail. Spring and autumn were magical times of warm and wet weather. You could see the earthworms sliding about, depositing castings, turning leaves, grass, twigs, manure into a sponge. But we no longer have spring and autumn. Those benign seasons seem to have drunk a few weeks only, not a, month, a few months. So near the end of the 17-year marriage of torture, I have to say to Steve, I constructed a passive solar mud brick house of natural and recycled materials, taking three years off from gardening to make bricks, to mill timber and recycle stuff to build at last proper accommodation. I eventually got back to my mission to plant all the steep hills with multi-use trees. The last hill was planted in 2011 with the help of my sister, Karen, and Stuart Seasink. He delivered me a load of gravel. He jumped out of his truck and into my life. He didn't know what he was in for. I was uh, certified organic for a year. It was 2003. And before too much of a honeymoon, demand for organics took off. And local markets used to uh, used to bother to go very rarely, but come back with $70 in the tin. But one day, these two Asian ladies just started fighting over my oranges and I realised something had shifted. On the first day at City Farm Perth Organic Growers Market, we came home with $700 in the tin. So thanks to the rise and rise of farmers markets, we've been able to ditch our outside jobs and become full-time farmers. And we're very grateful to all our loyal customers. Like Jenna, from when we arrived in 1985 and I began organic farming with Stuart in 2003, and up to 2008, abundant fruit, vegetables and plentiful grass was normal. Um, here's a Russian giant sunflower planted by itself, uh, self-sown in 2004 with my four-year-old son, Lee. He's now 23. Stuart and another volunteer Russian giant sunflower, 2003. And uh, just keep those pictures in mind because... We were living the dream. Organic food was valued by a certain percentage of the population. We loved our produce, and we had to, and we had time to spend on campaign. So forest protection, keep WA free. We failed on both, but yeah, we did our best there. Um, climate change. Oh, climate disaster hit home in two thousand and eight. The climate change that had been predicted for one hundred and twenty years was upon us. Rainfall had been declining for 35 years in WA. Permaculture hadn't become mainstream. The impact of the fossil fuel-based lifestyle on the, of the developed world, <clears throat> deforestation, uh, global agribusiness using chemicals and plough was now obvious. Things just died, even though we spent eight hours a day hand watering over these long summers. Um, in 2010, we got half our average rainfall. Spring was freaky dry for the first time in living memory. Formerly wet district turning to desert in front of our eyes. Uh, and that's continued. Russian giant sunflower plant. Cast your mind back a few slides. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2015. Uh, there's a couple of wilting sunflower plants there, five or six inches high. I've been watering them. I mulched them. They look like that. Never seen broad beans wilt before. What was going on? Hydrangea hedge and all my beautiful cottage garden just died off. You couldn't get the soil wet no matter what you did. The sprinkler this had a sprinkler run on, on it all night. Light rains were ineffective. Hungry animals actually died in long droughts in these long, long summers in spite of having hay, ad lib hay. We never used to have to buy hay and we ran more stock prior to 2008. These cows were so desperate for something green, they were reaching out too far in the swamp, getting drowning in the swamp, or we find them up to their necks in mud and drag them out with the tractor. Um, my farming friends were not talking about this climate change. There was this eerie silence. I wanted to talk about it and became unpopular at barbecues. 
There's nothing on the news about it. Maybe it was just Nana. Maybe it was just our place. Bill McKibben's 3050.org campaign showed me extreme weather was worldwide. Hotter, colder, wetter, drier, windier, stiller, many kinds of records were being broken. And there's a scene from Peru, some very dry land. We scrambled to get every drought strategy mentioned in permaculture texts installed. Uh, we went turned to YouTube Uni and devoured all these talks by Dr. Christine Jones, Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta, Jeff Lawton, Martin Dapper, Joel Salatin. We attended field days and conferences. And I was a Walter Yenne groupie. We needed to slow spread and sink the water. The pond down in the wettest corner of the property in 2011 it overflowed all year into the river. Next year it stopped flowing and last year it dried out completely. But we were going to irrigate the hillside of trees with that water, but we really couldn't do that. So experimental swale, an experimental swale was dug in 2010. Swale is a ditch on contour and uh, this proved to be really great. The tree guards you see there, all the trees in them, I didn't need to turn on the trickle irrigation line that I had set up only about twice for the whole summer, whereas rows of trees nearby without the swale effect, uh, I had to put the, the irrigation lines on three times a week to keep them alive. So this was a winner, and this is how the grass grew in that swale. Can you see that line of tall grass? That's because the swale filled up maybe only once and water soaked down into the ground, and the result is the grass are much tall, six times higher than surrounding. So we did five more swales in 2011. They're brilliant. Stuart laid them out with a laser level in one afternoon and dug them in the next afternoon with a tractor and a bucket. So it's a ditch on the contour. Uh, the dirt from the swale is piled on the downhill side and got so much done. So this is the swales today. Uh, one, one swale. Um, they're all like this. There's lemonade, lemons, the fajoas, cherry guava, Lots of fodder trees. So the fodder trees we planted are tagasasti, oaks, desert ash, bamboo, poplar, willow, mulberry. I think there's probably more I'm not thinking of, but all this green, these green things is appreciated very much by cows in the long dry season, and they've learnt to eat trees and acorns. <laughs> uh, so earthworks oh, for water harvesting, well, I'm always terracing because the flatter it is, the more ants water might soak into this poor soil we turned out to have. Um, I'm always laying logs across hills and anyone who wants to help me terrace the last hill, very welcome. Google Culture Mounds proved worthwhile. We did um, a lot of, well, we did one, this one here, the first one, Don't do it near Chooks, the Chooks flattened it. Um, but working beds were also great. And you can look these Hugel culture mounds and wicking beds up. And of course, you can play the replay and pause and read, and I'm just whooshing through it. Um, so learned the soil health principles and applied them. A, B, minimal, minimal mechanical disturbance, plant diversity, integrate livestock, continual live plant, 100% cover 100% of the time. And I think that never bear the soil rule is really important. Uh, so this is rotational grazing. We did the Alan Savory holistic management course and um, learned of keeping animals tightly bunched and moving, using the electric fence as kind of a proxy for a lion, for predators. Now pigs are very respectful of the electric fence and pigs will actually terrace the land for you. Uh, so you can see the mound on the downhill side that's been created by their snouts. Um, and if you put the fence on the contour, that's going to happen and it's going to be a speed bump for water. So we used to let them plough the fields. Now our golden rule is never bear the soil. So um, we quickly get them back in their pen if they've eaten all the grass off and are starting to dig. It, we used to plant, scatter seeds, mulch it, and they would grow like this. That's wheat, oats, barley and mixtures of things. The pigs can then be put back in that area to harvest those things. So Stuart is non-stop moving cows, geese, and chook right now and loving it. 
This Kiwi Tech fence, no, he doesn't. Kiwi Tech fence is Kiwi Tech fence is very, very good. You can carry a kilometre of fencing, or well, he can, I couldn't, and uh, reel out, wind back up very quickly. Um, we've tried all sorts of chook factors and we're kind of like the bamboo domes we make because they're light and, um, yeah, geese are fabulous. I love them. Uh, electro net fence keeps geese in and keeps foxes off them supposedly, so we've heard. We hope that's right. Stuart's also pretty good at shooting foxes and he's got 50 so far. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the geese will just convert IQU to manure and it will, yeah, they're just brilliant. You easily herded. Nature doesn't do monocrops, so multi-species fodder patches are improving soil and livestock health when you let them in a few times and then let it recover fully or as much as possible. Uh, you want at least an eight-way mix. Then drought resistance and frost resistance kicks in, and Dr Christine Jones has done a talk on that. All these measures were effective, and whenever it rained, everything grew. The wet season was now only two months long. It used to be eight. New pests moved in, spider mite, rats. Uh, they moved in everywhere. The towns are full of rats now. I don't know why. Permaculture, swales, rotational grazing, multi-species cover crops, wicking beds, hugel culture mounds. Was there anything else we could do? Someone called Dr Elaine Ingham was making big claims about soil microbes. I didn't think we could afford her courses and it took about a year before we finally in 2013 invested heavily in her first online soil course, later a microscope. Always looking down the microscope, my son, 10 now, does turd nerds. So biology is responsible for 90% of soil function. Without biology, soil is just simply geology, rock fragments in various sizes. The biological component is ignored by agronomy. The more aerobic life it contains, the more fertile the soil. And you can start with any clay or sand or they'll all become beautiful soil that behaves uh, like a chocolate mud cake. So Elaine promised the world she said the right soil biology is disease and pest resistance, makes nutrients available, assists decomposition of toxins, feeds decomposition of plant and animal residue, builds the soil structure and therefore root inflation storage of water, leads to ideal pH, affords drought and frost resistance in plants, discourages weeds, stops erosion and eutrophication of waterways, et cetera, et cetera. The benefits went on and on. And these benefits could happen overnight or in one growing season. I was sceptical. She said the soil, a good soil, was like a chocolate mud cake. I didn't have chocolate mud cake. I had a latte pale colour about my soil and a hard layer of compaction just a few centimetres down, small pale plants, and all the, her promises seemed just a bit too good to be true. But we started learning. Humus is a dark chocolate colour and it is the most precious part of all nature. It is the storage place for water and minerals in the soil. It's colloid like butter and can hold 10 times its weight in water. And humus is where it's at. Elaine's program involves testing the soil for biology, breeding up the missing creatures. There's groups of creatures that aren't there. Well, we need to breed them up. How can we do that? In compost heaps or worm farms. And then we can... Re Put, uh, make a solution of that uh, material, the, uh, the completed compost, and put it out on the paddock. In a worm farm, worms do sanitising and aeration of organic matter for you, creating cool compost or vermicast. Weed seeds do supply, uh, survive that process, but in a hot compost heap, high temperatures, you've got to get over 55, and that kills the pathogens in the weed seeds breeds the beneficial microbes as long as you aerate and turn the pile when the temperature reaches 68. Because that is your zone, 12 degrees, your breeding beneficials, are uh, to 72, you're killing them. So you want to keep in that zone. I had made compost forever. Now we had proper guidance from a scientist. And thermometer, very important. You can't do this without one. We made 10 compost heaps over 2014, so keen to experience the benefits Elaine promised. Sadly, they were all too hot. Yes, we must have been slow learners. We had to turn them every morning with garden forks uh, for getting that wrong. It always kept worm farms too. 
The idea from Elaine to insert a teaspoon of soil from a native forest, which would contain all these wonderful organisms, hadn't been seen on this land for so long since farming practices had eradicated them, like burning and liming and fertilising. Worms will cleanse the forest soil of any diseases. And the good bugs will multiply in that protected environment, good fungi and all. Students were implored to take only a teaspoon of forest soil, and I will implore you, anyone listening to, who thinks some naughty men think they will ignore this and get trailer loads full of forest soil and shame on you. We couldn't breed fungi. Fungi was eluding us. Someone from Mount Barker told me in a public forum that it couldn't be done in WA. He said his boss had spent a million dollars and eight years and failed. Maybe Elaine didn't realise how tough Western Australia is. I phoned a friend, Hayden, had been listening to Elaine's free talks for some time and making compost teas, and I'm sure he'll be on the replay. He said, don't give up, B, this really works, and he sent me some show-off photos. And who's and ours, I'm sure, are happening out there. Like, look at that cabbage, look at the carrot, and... Hayden is not a midget. He's six foot something. So, yeah. Anyway, Hayden gave us some of his creme de la creme compost and we brewed our first tea with a tiny, well, the biggest aquarium pump the pet shop had and a 20-litre bucket. And it went bloop, 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 bloop. And if Stuart put this in a backpack and sprayed a mist, just a mist of this tea on the corn plants behind Stuart, Three weeks after spraying, they jumped out of the ground. I wasn't allowed to know. It was a double bribe. No, it was a blind trial. And I guessed quite easily which ones got the bee because they just grew bigger and the bees were buzzing around them. And I've even videoed uh, the bees buzzing around them uh, on the U Winfield YouTube channel. You can find that. So in front of Stuart is the short corn that didn't get the um, compost tea. And the ones that did had big cobs. And uh, there were some bean plants. The beans got, that got the spray recovered from mites and produced oodles of beans. And I do mean compost spray. Control beans died. So very encouraged, we pressed on pursuing that holy grail of fungal domination. I kept studying. I learnt the sign of a healthy soil with the number and diversity of soil microbes. We were seeing heaps of amazing critters under the microscope, but we didn't know what they were, and some of them turned out to be air bubbles or my eyelash. As the months wore on, burning compost heaps, and we're still not seeing fungi or any plant response, I began to believe the man who said fungal compost couldn't be made in WA. After all, Hayden lived right on the coast, pretty mild weather compared to inland where we are, but really keen to know if this biology stuff was worth persisting with. I was hard to convince, wasn't I? I cheated. I purchased some fungal-dominated compost from Dr Mary Cole and Alan Cole in Victoria. Three kgs of compost arrived in the mail. I mixed up a solution and poured it on, on half the chicory patch. Two weeks later, the plants began to show a response. Of course, I didn't take a photo poured it on. I have no before shot. This was taken two weeks later. And the plants in the foreground had been the biggest. So you can see there is a definite improvement in the size. They survived all summer. The ones on the left-hand side where Lee's feet are, um, they survived all summer, whereas the ones on the right-hand side of the stick died. Okay, so miracles happen with other people's compost. If we could just achieve a fungal compost for ourselves, we could just Take a few kilos of this and inoculate and bring back to life more than 100 acres. That is cheap and easy to do with modern equipment. Under the scope, we saw we had very few living things, only rocks and plant fibres really. Not, I can't see any but a symmetrical looking creatures there. Not a fungal strand in sight in our compost either. I'd seen plenty of fungi in forest soil under the microscope. Surely then I needed to emulate the forest floor even more. We built one more heap and put lots of twigs and bark and gum nuts in it, eucalyptus leaves and things no one would think would make a good compost. We turned it without much hope and then forgot the whole darn thing, the microscope and carbon. I had a 
bucket of mixed seeds and I always made furrows and sowed these seeds in the wake of a chook home, which moved every three weeks. A new compost heap had been used to cover the latest um, seed planting. And what's this? For once, all the seeds germinated and actually grew. And I got the microscope and I saw that this, you know, the, the old latest compost we've made with the eucalyptus leaves was fungal. Eureka! We had finely bred organisms not seen on this land since it was first cleared. The multi-species crop in the red ring grew well from just a light application of this good compost. In the blue ring, only the barley we overfed the chooks with grew. This is in the blue ring, lots of water needed. Keep the pathetic alfalfa alive for a few more days, I think right after that. Look at the sludge created by hours of standing there with a the hose going. So much water, no result. In the red ring, this one, two weeks younger plant, doesn't need water every day now. So much healthier. So uh, as the monks went on, uh, the, I watered the barley and, and these evenly, but the barley turned brown, so I did stop watering it. And look at the dogs, Matilda and Albie, designating the centre point between compost extract with fungi and compost extract, or no, solid compost, without. Nothing short of a miracle. So sunflowers are giants again. Hey, and I am still hosing. We started putting this compost everywhere and seeing great results from it. And we looked under the microscope and there was the fun. I just um, show you with these red arrows what... A fungal complex looks like there's many, a couple of different, three different species there, I think, and a spore. Um, we've, the spore looked like the apple seed. We've also started to see visible mycelium in our compost piles for once, like a net, fuzzy net hanging everything together. That's a good sign. Went on to do many trials. You can peruse and at your leisure. There was visible differences in the colour of this, um, this dirt that got compost extract. Literally overnight, it changed colour. This is not my photo. It's all this. Um, more trials, trials. This place had only ever grown kaiku use, and this is a beautiful crop of um, mixed things, fodder, plant for us. Um, Elaine shows in this slide 42% of clover in the compost tea spray paddock, while just 6% of clover found in control paddock. And this is what we found too. This is our place and right-hand side of the black line got the compost tea. Note the legumes are abundant here, whereas the other side, nothing. And there's a close-up of the legumes. The stump experiment, this is where over winter once a month I put out a compost tea and only ever sprayed the left-hand side of this stump you can barely see there in the driveway. So first compost tea sprayed in June 2015, then again in July, east side of the stump only sprayed, and then August, we're seeing no difference. By November, everything's drying off, but not on the left-hand side of the stump the right-hand side of the stump. Trust me, we didn't have any one mow or bring a herd of animals in to eat that or stand on it a lot. And there's the final photo of that series. No irrigation, no rain, and this grass just kept growing all summer. And I hope that's very encouraging because it certainly encouraged us. So we, yeah, we've got to do this in all the paddocks, right? And so we did. Was it the mob grazing or the compost tea or the swales? I guess we'll never know. Oh, yes, we will, because, yeah, there was a patch further down that we did past compost tea. I went the furthest I've ever been with the backpack on with my son Chris and Sylvia's wife in tow, and we saw a fabulous result from that. And the grazing hadn't happened. The swales weren't in that area. So um, here's the neighbour's place in the distance in the orange ring. They had brown grass too, but it was very short compared to... Masses of standing hay that we had. Masses of grass, even in low rainfall. Cleaning up after the first shower in autumn. And this is my, um, I think, most telling slide because 
In the left hand top corner, there is the neighbour's river flat is showing, and it is a sort of palish brown, if not very pale green, as compared to lovely green pigs that have been compost tea sprayed. The, looking at, um, that was the to the east of us and now to the west, same bill. That's the boundary fence just in front of the tree and uh, definitely something good happening on the organic side of the fence. I poured a bucket of compost solution on a row of tomatoes, or two rows, one treated, recovered from root disease, while those in the back row which did not receive the compost extract continued to go down and die. So they went on to have tomatoes. Now I had some show-off picks of my own. I thought I had a dozen beetroots to take to the market, but it turned out to be only three. Each one weighed four kilos, pretty much. Uh, the Three Sisters patch, so in January 2019, it's three sisters as corn, bean and squash, and found by the American Indians to be a great symbiotic sort of, um, mixed crop and it got sprayed mid-February. I had to plant into dust and I ran a sprinkler, one sprinkler. Um, by February 28th, it was doing very well. Powering through, no spider mite. Before long, that little sprinkler got buried in the vegetation and could no longer water the patch. So it somehow thrived without water, the whole thing, literally through the blazing sun of summer. By May, I was getting actually tired of harvesting all the pumpkins and corn out of this patch. There's something I've never had a problem with of harvesting, like being tired of carrying stuff in. So time to shout it from the rooftops. Hey, farmers and gardeners, we, you can save your dollars and save your health. Soil principles work. Get missing microbes, unlock the nutrients from your rocks, pebbles, sand, silt and clay. Uh, some participants sent me photos of great success in their veggie garden. This lady, Robin Brown, sent on, um, me uh, pictures of her lettuce. On the left was um, had compost tea put on them. On the right, none. And Robin went on to improve a horse paddock. And she sent me this photo literally six weeks after doing my course and reading my book. So good on you, Robin. Uh, so how do we get this to a wider audience? Do we get on Gardening Australia or Landline like Try. Um, I, I did befriend Christine Jones, this gorgeous lady. Um, I was rubbing shoulders with them. Big Food and Big Pharma. Let's face it, facts, they exist only to profit by selling chemicals and these corporations have the funds to control the media, employ trolls, heads of universities, politicians, maybe even celebrity gardeners. I think the last three, three years has brought this into sharp focus Propaganda manipulates actions and behaviours, and um, soon it's all going to be revealed and will be the truth all out. We purchased a tractor to help comp make compost, a spray tank, a whole proper compost solution, a low disturbance cedar, and we went about planting mixes of seeds, including perennial grasses like kangaroo grass, wallaby grass, fescue, phalaris, prairie grass, perennial rye. These are all expensive seeds and kind of wasted them because really this soil, it's growing capeweed, which shows us the soil is not in very good nick. Um, but we were ever hopeful that the compost tea could pick seeds and they, if we were lucky and had a good a sort of rainy season, but we weren't lucky. So a lot of times we saw them come up in nice rows, but they didn't survive the summer. Sometimes we ran out of daylight doing this. Now, a typical Australian boundary fence with six strands of plain wire and two of barb, you can see in the distance there. Impervious new ideas, and I thank Karen Doherty for that joke. Dark kingdom under our feet. It's the soil food web, mini version of food chains we can see on the land, in the water, like you see on, oh, you know, TV, lions eating the water beast. The decomposers of the planet are the first rung. They're the bacteria and, and fungi. Then uh, you have the protozoa and microarthropods They are and nematodes. They move into eat the bacteria and fungi. And the predators, their manure is full of all the minerals that were in those little tiny creatures that eat rocks and the organic matter. 
Next come the really big predatory nematodes and mites. Think of these hunters as the big cats. They poop out nutrients, mainly nitrogen in plant available form. I'd like to now mention these groups of, in, the, in this dark kingdom that you should find in compost. And if you have any of them missing, it's not going to work so well. Um, bacteria and fungi. Uh, here's a picture of some oxi ones and rod shaped ones. Spiral, we don't want to see too many of them because the first the ones on the left are aerobic organisms. And same here, the graph here, graphic of the bacillus and the cocci. They're the good guys, but then we have spirillum, spirochetes, and vibrios. They only grow in um, airless situation, which um, they're really dangerous microbes. If you get one of them in a cut, you could lose your arm through flesh eaters. So uh, very unusual circumstances would have to be to, for that to happen. Um, but chains of um, bacillus look really specky under the microscope. Chains of oxide and clusters. They, um, oh, let's go back. they like to eat simple sugars and simple proteins. They grow and divide, grow and divide. That's what they do rapidly where there is food and moisture. No. I think we'll just have to rush through this a bit. It's getting near the end of time. So I was rushing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so we will. So, so structure <laughs> is so important and life, uh, bacterial life makes the structure. The glues glue the particles together to form microaggregates, fungi, glue them together with, with the strands and the marlin sticky acid secretion they make, um, pseudomonas bacteria and break down benzene rings. Therefore, they can, pseudomonas bacteria is excreted by worms in their worm castings and DDT, dildren, heptachlor, those things that organochlorines and phosphates that last 500 years in the soil. So you can decontaminate land with worm castings. Um, you can see the sludge that occurs when on the right when there's no fungi there, but on the left, lovely lumps of aggregates. Um, and B, and you're also going to share this. We'll send out this as a PDF to the people who are on the call. So you can take your leisure and read. You might, you know, be concerned, mm -hmm. but we'll make them available for you. It just B has quite a lot more to share with us. And I love these slides. But if we could um, get down to you, please. Um, amazing. <laughs> so all those critters and the water stops running off, uh, appearing in the pig paddock seconds after you apply it up the hill. Um, and in that dark, um, um, food and oxygen-rich environment under mulch, the soil food web thrives. Eventually it, it, uh, eventually, it takes three years to build beautiful soil from dust. Um, but I don't know if these slides mean anything, but there are very few symmetrical-looking things in there, and that means there's not much life, whereas here... Well, that's a close-up of a fungi, but out of focus, I can see lots of dots and lots of rod bacillus, lots of cocci and some cysts that may be amoebae cysts, uh, eggs of there is flagellates and amoebae. And there's a nice dark brown fungi, and I do love to see the fungi under the microscope because it took so long to see it. Soil is performing its functions now, and look, I've got my cottage plants back. I've got great avocado crops. I've got... Citrus, figs, macadamias, and my cottage gardens is actually better than ever. And all thanks to Dr. Elaine. And then there's this doctor, another wonderful woman, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, knows how to treat psychological and other conditions with detoxing activities and organic diet, majoring in fermented food. A faulty microbiome leading to a leaky gut can result in allergies, eczema, asthma, epilepsy, anorexia fatigue, MS, just to name a few of the conditions which respond to the GAPS nutritional protocol. And I became a GAPS coach in 2020. Um, so the parallels between soil biology and gut flora, and there are a lot of, you know, lactobacillus in the soil do great, does great work as it does in our gut. So these 
the same kind of organisms, if not the same. In the gut, um, they will. you have all your good gut flora, you, you have a strong immune system, maintain your health and integrity of the gut wall, nourish the body, that is their main function, through pop, proper digestion and absorption of proteins and fermentation of carbohydrates and Synthesize vitamins K2, B5, folic acid, B1, B2, B3, B6, and B12. Well-nourished body produces strong stomach acid, which com completes uh, gluten and casein digestion, so that morphine-like substances are not passing through the gut wall into the bloodstream, making us crazy. We keep pathogenic strains in check, but the good guys keep the bad guys under control in small populations. If you knock them out, um, say if you eat, Commercial, like processed food, food from supermarket, even organic, I'm sad to say, I've heard from Dr. Natasha, can be um, and contain residues of Roundup. Roundup preferentially kills a probiotic good gut flora and leaves the pathogens, actually feeds them. So what does damage our gut flora? Stress, antibiotics, pharmaceuticals of other kinds, particularly the pill and Panadol, Sugar, processed foods, personal care and cleaning products, Wi-Fi, pesticides. So GAPS coaches are all about training people to make their own toothpaste, make their own deodorant. We, we can give simple recipes for that. Um, avoid uh, anything but organic food. So how do we repair the gut lining? Mainly with meat stock. GAPS diet builds healthy cells with a few ingest um Foods rich in fat and protein, you're going to be able to, the body can pick out the old cells, it has the building resources to make new cells and healthy ones. Bad bacteria convert foods in the compost heap into toxic gases and they make horrible things like alcohol, formaldehyde and phenols. Well, the bad bacteria, if they overgrow in our gut, they make those things too. And there's people who can just eat something sugary and become drunk without having alcohol. So that's how normal their gut flora is. We're, we're going to try to, um, by consuming the eggs, meat, fish, seafood, butter, and fermented dairy, pathogens actually go dormant and stop making their poisons and uh, making the person crazy or, addicted or all sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, pathogens love sugar and grain, so we avoid them. We can have honey and fruit, though, but in small doses in the beginning while the gut lining heals. I've put here a recipe for making cabbage tonic, which is very probiotic. Just will, you can see that at your leisure, but start off taking a drop only and increase gradually to a maximum of half a cup a day. This is a strong probiotic, much better than what you can buy in the shops for $50 per quincy bottle. Uh, this will cost you nothing much to make. You do have to find organic vegetables to make those ferments with. Others won't work. The organic ones are crawling with the lactobacillus that is needed. So I've had amazing success with the five families. I, I did a freebie. Um, I won't be doing freebies anymore, I'm sorry, because it became a full-time job. Not only that, my ongoing education in this area is very expensive. I do need to charge now, but um, I'm fully encouraged by, well, if I have got time to share a little couple of stories. Um, have I, Helen? Um, yes, I'm just looking at the time now. It's so, um, so late. 10, okay. that's 11, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so we're into, into, into uh, something. <laughs> I want to hear them. I'm, I'm a, I'm I will a, just quickly. Um, one little girl, three years old, covered in eczema, six months later, oh. skin clear and beautiful, happier in every way. She was being so disfigured, kids were pointing at her in the street. Um, she's uh, going to play group, loving it, and all the play group parents who saw her then want to know what is mother doing. Uh, so mother, the parents were desperate. She also had ulcerative colitis. That cleared up as well. Um but in the stool. And then uh, another family, a 10-year-old boy with the whole family had insomnia. Actually, after the parents were vaccinated, they all became anxious. 
the whole family and, and we're all on melatonin trying to sleep except for one. There was three children, two parents. Um, this boy had insomnia and OCD. I think he'd had it for a while. It was quite a problem. And um, three weeks on a good diet, meat-based diet, he literally walked into this house, a confident, happy young man. He had grown taller and his physique had changed. It was a real transformation in his mind and his body. And teachers had been commenting simply because his parents brought sides of organic meat and cooked up those meals at home from scratch with some organic vegetables and ditched the processed foods. They had been eating junk foods. So um, that was just awesome. Um, yeah, so that's my, my – and uh, I've got every hope of help and helping people with more really chronic severe issues like severe autism. Um, my um, – down in a town near us, I'm not going to even say the town – uh, is, is five nearly, if not turned five now, and he did have failure to thrive, meaning he was on the lowest percentile. He just wasn't growing. He was very skinny. He had awful gut um, pains whenever he ate anything. He is now thriving and becoming, uh, say, he was nonverbal right up until maybe two months ago. He's now saying words and very recently sentences. So we've he's on the GAPS diet. I think our produce is super duper and make the trip to buy it regularly. But also we're we're doing a, an experimental um well it isn't it was on the market for five years as an antioxidant it's a supplement it was curing children of autism. Um, parents were following on their box that the kid was recovered doctors were removing diagnoses and fda got wind of this this factory was making the supplement uh, was in america they came down and shut the factory they said if this is curing it's a drug and as a drug you need drug status approval and they've put the inventor or discoverer of this chemical which is found in naturally in cinnamon and cranberries Dr. Boyd Haley, he's 84, and they're putting him through the last 11, 10, I think even, I'm not sure, I'm not sure on the years, but it's at least 10 years, one trial after another. It's cost him millions of dollars. Most other drugs would be approved if it just didn't kill anyone. Uh, but he has never had an adverse event report from this um, substance. So, yeah. We're able to get this. You know, it's not exactly legal. It is not approved for pet or human consumption, but it is available for experimental research purposes. And um, <clears throat> we're experimenting. So there you go. That's, that's pretty much it. Uh, this is my ad and has my email address. Um and you can find us at Margaret River Markets on most Saturday mornings. And I thank you very much for listening. And I hope it's time for a few questions. Bea, thank you. Um, if you stop sharing now, we'll go across to our normal thing. Um, I'm sure <laughs> we could follow on with this for um, many sessions. But hand up who would like to actually follow on with be with her food and what she's more specifically what she's been sharing today. I'll put up the um, gallery here. Uh, if you want to unmute now, if you want to ask a question, um, be just to make clear the your work with the gaps really came from the fact that you had food you were supplying organic food at the market. And you started, notice, people were noticing a difference, but you started this whole passion of fermenting. Have you got any of your ferments there to um, note? <laughs> yep, sure. I can go and get one. Yeah, great. Because B has um, shared while we've been preparing all of this, she shared some very simple recipes with me and she said they are on her YouTube. Um, and I'll get her to put the... Um, Address it's also it. on the slide, Helen, there is a slide with the whole recipe. And it's um, 
It's always very simple, but when you're dealing with people who are very ill, you have to write absolutely every detail down, yep. cover all bases. So um, it turns out to be quite a long slide. <laughs> um, this is kefir, which is raw organic Jersey milk. Um, and a, a clumps of grains in there. I've did the powdered uh, kefir, but the grain kefir is much nicer. Um, yep. So, yeah, beet kvass, it, it's just delicious. You wouldn't believe how yummy it is. It looks gross, but it's lovely. Uh, and if you put garlic in there, that's uh, awfully good antibiotic. And uh, if you're feeling a bit coming down with a cold, slurp on some cabbage uh, sauerkraut juice. Have you got and some of this start. on YouTube, your recipes or not? Oh, yes. Uh, How to Make Beet Kvass is, is uh, on there, on the yeah. YouTube channel, Bee Winfield channel. Yeah. But it's really too easy, Helen. You just take a glass jar. Everything's got to be glass. We don't do anything in plastic because of that. That, of course, gives us chemicals. Now, whole, the whole thing about GAPS is we're detoxing. Um, we're removing ourselves from the toxic world as much as possible so we're turning, we're cabling our computers. Not, you know, you ask how I started. Uh, there's a lovely lady here called Jenna on this call. And Jenna, there she is. She put Yellow Gap's book in my hand and said, you should read this. <laughs> um, of course, I, I didn't pay it a lot of attention. I did get a bit. But you know what? Gap's diets are pretty complicated. Uh, like, because Dr. Natasha's very careful and she wants to. Cover all bases. Um, this is her. She did a blue book and a yellow book. The, the blue book is the latest one. That is small print, a very thick book. So there is a lot to it. And the general principles are that we're removing the toxins from as our environment as much as possible. Wi-Fi is a is a toxin. So. Um, yeah, I've got, I don't actually have a mobile phone, but I do as a camera and a recording device. And it, I have that on aeroplane mode all the time. But I can, I've got my cabled laptop on aeroplane mode. It's just coming through the ethernet. And we can turn the Wi-Fi on occasionally for a short time. But we don't like exposing our house plants or, or us to it, or even our ferments, because it does hurt microbes. So I will record Talks on this and put it in my little bag and um, strap it on and go work in the garden and listen to all these brilliant people I can record. And, you know, who doesn't love this information age? It's got a lot of good things about it, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bea, you, you are full of information. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry for the late start because we knew we had a jam pack session. Um, you that was probably all my fault, so I'm so sorry. No, no, Just, no. No, yeah. all good. Um, you had a photo on your phone you'd taken this morning when you'd been out for a walk. Hmm, yeah. Well, so I, I think had, so cool. the, the man Hayden, I don't know if he, he will definitely be on the replay, and he came here to, um, well, he gave us this compost, didn't he? That made yep. this amazing um, reaction on our plants. And, of course, his... Carrots, cabbage, and strawberries. If you can cast your mind back to them, well, he saw this. He saw this area I photographed today with um, five or four years ago. It was bare dirt, and it was such a miserable scene. I was watering, but I had to make dishes around plants, fill them up with half a cup of water, and wait 20, 30 minutes for that to go in. Yeah. and then repeat. So I've spent many summers improving soil by doing that because um, we're not going to get any rain here for six months. From end of August to April, uh, there'll be no rain. So, yeah, I, I'd love to show that photo, Helen, but I, I'm just um, terrified of losing. I mean, I've, I, I could get it really easy if I didn't lose everything or anyway but I'll, I'll try will I or you won't say goodbye now in case the worst comes us and our technology hmm no I just try I, no I don't know how to do that Helen sorry no I have to do that later we'll have to do another one 
Well, Pete, I'll show you that photo. Believe me, I'll send it to you, Hayden. How that place <laughs> is transformed with with um, the good microbes and the, the manure. Pete, I really commend you because you're so focused and so determined and so hardworking in in keeping on going and believing. And I just think it's an absolute, um, you know, what's the word? Anyway, whatever it is. Yeah, who do, what's the word? What, is the word? what you have done and achieved, and I can remember when you were doing the, uh, micro, uh, the soil course with your compost, you were on uh, line quite a bit. You were so excited getting those that change coming through and it took quite a while for you to get your compost right and I think it's a great lesson for people to just keep going. It works. And I thank you because... Yes, it works. A really great message. And I'm very interested now with the food you're doing and I think we could have... Um, Probably some little mini chats too of different things with you and you'll put them up on YouTube or share them with our Farming Secrets members because you're um, an absolute wealth of information. So oh, thanks, Helen. So thank you. And is there, before we go, is there anyone want to put in chat anything? Uh, there was a question about how you make your compost bear and I said it's too long to the person for asking, but you probably have things on YouTube, you have things in your book. Well, which definitely is in the book. It's all in the book, Helen, and we're, we're going to release that soon, aren't we? We've we are, we are. <laughs> so. Um, bigger and better, not bigger, better. Yeah, yes, I'm just mm. helping be a little bit. I'm, I'm becoming your editor. <laughs> thank you. Many have tried and failed. Many have tried for a while and given up. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, no, and you've got so many fantastic, what's the name of the book, Yellow Gaps? <laughs> I'm asking, what is the name of your book? My book, Nourishing Soil. That's right, yeah. So um, there you go. But we'll put the details on with the this webinar replay. And uh, any any more questions before we go, any more comments? I would really like to thank B on behalf of us all. Um, someone's come in to hijack our screen. Um, George Clark's screen. Who's he? George, can you stop sharing, please? I don't know whether I can get him off. George? No, thank you. That's better. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And it, um, you do have quite a few recommendations, which are probably in your slides, which please kindly make it available to us as a PDF because she has got a lot of um, books that she's referred to and recommends. And, you know, that's just a wonderful assistance to everyone. All right. Well, I, I, I better, better not promise anything on the PDF. Definitely think if you I went uh, to quite a bit of trouble to write all the words on these slides, you need to know. So if you just rely on the replay, just pause it and read it, you'll get it. Okay, cool. I'm not going to make any promises about PDF because that sounds technical, Helen. <laughs> and I don't have millennials on hand. You're practical. All right. <laughs> exactly. Thank yeah, well, thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in and coming out uh, taking time out of your busy lives i hope you got something out of it or we'll get more out of it in the future when the replay comes out and uh thank you so much helen and hugo for everything you do um, our pleasure and thank you and thank everyone who's been on the call and people watching the replay um it's wonderful having people interested in making a uh, a better place, a healthier place. And I think to emphasize with what Bea is doing, it's ideal. She has a small farm, she has enough produce to take to market, and there's a whole little community that she's serving in her uh, area. And that's what we need to see more of, more community working together with healthy, nutritious food. 
And we really can't get enough of that healthy, nutritious food. Uh, we can't produce it. When a GAPS client needs to have eight eggs a day, we need more egg producers. We need more people doing uh, small animals uh, for meat. Um, goat's milk is not done in WA in an organic, certified organic way. So there is plenty of farmers needed, plenty of gardeners needed, really. We need lots of cabbages, beetroots, carrots, cauliflower, all those for the ferments. Um, and they, these, you literally be making medicine to help um, children thrive. And yeah, I hope you can have every success. And I think it starts with the soil and hopefully today you've got a few ideas of how to get water into the soil to build the soil and to allow the organisms the moisture to make the humus. There you go. Well said. All right, on that note, thank you and we'll see you again and thanks everyone again and we'll say goodbye now. Bye. 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 See ya.